Welcome to Weekend Watches 3. Thank you, by the way, for everyone who made our first Wednesday morning show a huge success. Much obliged. As you know, I'm out riding while you're watching this, and I thank you for joining me as I gather some of the finest watches ever portrayed on this table. Let's start with a stunner from the Far East. This is the 2015 500 piece limited edition Grand Seiko Spring Drive GMT SBGE 033, the 33 41 millimeters in stainless steel, that is Zeratsu optically flawless, black polished, mirrored stainless steel. Normally, that hand finished case is the highlight of any watch fortunate enough to be so bestowed, but this watch with an electrifying sunburst green dial featuring red and silver subordinate tones absolutely explodes. And that's before we even talk about the depth of this dished dial. The case features both satin finish and polish for much needed contrast as the black polish can overwhelm. And at 41 millimeters, this timepiece simply explodes off the wrist. Turn it all over and you have a Grand Seiko 9R spring drive automatic. The 9R66 has a three-day power reserve, and it essentially courts precision with mechanical sole, as there are no motors, no capacitors, no batteries, and this unidirectional governing wheel acts in lieu of a balance as the regulator. So a back EMF, or electromagnetic force, either slows or accelerates this wheel, which is driven exclusively by the mainspring. So you have a watch that's accurate to plus or minus 15 seconds per month. Automatic winding, of course. You can see there's a power reserve on the dial side to keep track of that reserved mosh, and a perfectly smooth sweep of the seconds hand, denoting the spring drive caliber. There are no steps because that unidirectional wheel is solely responsible for governing and driving that hand, a fully spring-driven watch that achieves quartz precision, built, regulated, and when the time comes, serviced by a watchmaker. This one's highly water-resistant, swimmable, and nicely loomed. This might be the perfect watch. In fact, I'm going to throw the perfect watch on my wrist. My erstwhile perfect watch, the Zen Easy M11. We'll take a little break, and we'll take a look at the SBGE 033, a watch that I like so much, honestly, it feels and looks at home on my wrist. Now you can see it has a broad lug stance, but the case is also nicely curved to arc around the wrist. So though it's a burly watch on the wrist and not terribly thin, it has an elegant presence to it because of its curvature, its hand finished case, and its immaculate sunburst dial. You can even see from more of a distance, the dial is still expressive, visible, and vibrant. This is an incredible timepiece. And to cap it all off, you get a full Grand Seiko steel deployant clasp. You can see that this this piece, limited edition of 500, that's the SBGE 033, a truly special watch, but not the only green dial on the table tonight. I'm going to hold my fire and switch to salmon before we go green once more. Now, though salmon copper in tone, this is a Rolex dial to make you green with envy. You're looking at a Rolex date just 16234, the fluted white gold bezel ringing a Roman numeral dial in which the crown, the hands, and the Roman numerals are also in white gold. This is, of course, a T dial as the watch is a lovely vintage piece, a handsome dial, a handsome case, and immaculate lugs. I need to emphasize that the lugs on this watch are straight, symmetrical, and full, and I really can't overemphasize that this is the first thing I look to when I'm discussing a Rolex of vintage status. This is a watch that is an S serial code, so early 1990s, and it's essentially just as it would have left Geneva, with the lugs full, the dial immaculate, and the bracelet, which you can see is the Rolex Jubilee, Effectively, just as strong as when it left Geneva, all of these have a little bit of Rolex rattle, but there is a difference between the rattle and the stretch, and this one is on the right side of that divide. Throwing it on the wrist, it's an elegant piece, still 100 meters water resistant. I actually find the Jubilee vents so well. I prefer it in many instances in hot weather to the Three Link Oyster. This is a timepiece that is graceful on the wrist, easy to accommodate, wonderfully comfortable, and I need to emphasize it's also wonderfully versatile, though it is a dress watch. It is not exclusively a dress watch as it features the movement of a Rolex Submariner, swimmable water resistance, and on the stainless steel band, you have the ability to jump in the pool without worry about swapping out a leather strap. And that's always the limit of water resistant watches on leather straps. Like the Grand Seiko, 
This is a wonderful watch that you can wear all the time, but you do have to take it off this strap before swimming with it. Whereas on a full bracelet, you find that a Rolex gives you a level of carefree versatility. And that continues on this reference 16200. Now you can see the 16200, a graceful sunburst blue dial. This is distinct from the salmon copper, and it's a bit more lively. This one, a little less formal, a bit more exuberant and sporty because of the color and the tone, as well as the way the blue in particular catches the light. Similar Roman numeral white gold appliques, but you'll love that there's a white on blueprint for the railroad track outboard. Now, this one is on the more substantial Rolex Oyster bracelet. You can see it's a little bit less flexible than the Jubilee. They're both comfortable, but ultimately it comes down to a question of style. Do you prefer the burlier look of the Oyster? For a lot of folks with a 36 millimeter case, they're gonna want the Oyster bracelet to give the watch a more imposing, masculine, physically impressive persona on the wrist. And it does have that. But with the dial, it also has a little bit of a joie de vivre or a joy for life, a color and character that's often missing from other Rolex models, especially the sporting versions. Okay, I promised you green dials galore today, and I'm gonna deliver, but let's take one more detour through the world of color, and this is a colorful cadran. You can see Vacheron Constantin oversees self-winding. Now, I know every other brand will call this an automatic. In Vacheron, well, this is a self-winding, but regardless of the nomenclature, the size and the proportioning are perfect for the generation two overseas that preceded this. The chronograph was the one to get. This third generation watch launched in 2016, well, the self-winding is the one to own. 41 millimeters in steel. You can see this unique brown bronze dial with several different brown tones. You can see the light orbiting the dial in the satin finished hour track. White gold indices, white gold hand, white gold Maltese cross, and then you can see the depth of the dial with another lovely track outboard in a gloss brown to match the center. This is a wonderfully nuanced dial in a watch that has so much to recommend it. You can easily and quickly even with my diminished nails, remove the bracelet as the watch comes with a quick release system underneath that allows you to rapidly denude it of either its strap or its bracelet. And the watch comes with two accessory straps, both in brown to match the dial. One is leather, one is rubber, and there's a separate steel deployant clasp for them. Now roll around and you can see a few exceptional features of this watch, starting with the fact that every individual link of the bracelet is removable and that on both sides of the bracelet. So you can size this one precisely. What you might not see at first glance is the micro adjustment that's built into both sides of the clasp. So you have an incremental adjustment of about 1.5 millimeter and you have it in each side of the clasp. So you really can fine tune by removing any link that offends and then using two sides of the clasp with that micrometric adjustment to find the perfect fit. Let's pull the bracelet off both sides and take a look at the Vacheron Caliber 5100. Now, gleaming through the case back, gleaming and beaming, you can see the 5100 is something else. Automatic winding, 54 hour power reserve, and engraved 22, not 21, not 18 karat mass, 22 karat mass with a compass rose pattern, and note that it is alternately frosted and satin finished with relieved and polished letters, as well as compass rose points at center. The timepiece featuring Cote de Genève immaculately laid down, and you can see that gradient that's the sign of real Cote de Genève across the bridges perfectly aligned. See how one side is light while the other side is dark? That's the difference between abrasive wheel Cote de Genève and stamped. Now you will note this is Geneva Hallmark and you can see the Poinçon de Genève on the bridge just underneath my finger. The edge of every bridge, and I'll see if I can catch the light and show you what I'm talking about, but the edge of every bridge, and here you can see it underneath my finger, is mirrored and rounded with a hand chamfer, that optically smooth mirrored chamfer known as anglage, perfectly executed with every screw head as well as the cap of the the shock protection, fully black polished, and you can see the cap of the regulator, black polished, a balance beaten away at 28.8. This is a modern long-legged caliber that is robustly anti-magnetic to 25,000 ampere per meter. Keep in mind that the definition of an anti-magnetic watch, ISO 764, is 4,800 ampere per meter. This watch is 25,000 and 150 meters water resistant. It's got a lot going for it that even a Royal Oak Offshore can't quite boast. Now the standard offshore has a water resistance rating of 100 meters and for some that will be plenty, especially when the watch has this much flamboyant flair about it. This is the 2017 50-piece limited edition 
Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Full Platinum. You've heard of the brick, you've heard of the pounder, the full rose gold model on rose gold bracelet. Well, forget that. This watch, as I weigh it, is only 20 grams short of one full pound, weighing over 430 grams. This is a timepiece that you cannot forget on the wrist. You can't forget the quality, the substance, or the privilege of encountering something this exquisite. It's finished as a royal oak is, immaculately and by hand, to create those perfectly aligned bevels across the shoulders of the links, the diminishing taper of the bevel on the lug hoods and the lug profile, the break between the rounded and polished flank of the bezel and the satin finished hood. You could see the perfect alignment of the bolts around the bezel. They are just below the plane of the platinum bezel. The bolts of stainless steel surrounding a dial that is a gradient fade at its center where it's almost silver argent to an almost brown bronze at its outer periphery. White gold applique numerals in hands and a black tachymeter in metallic black outboard. This is a dramatic watch. Now it is an imposing piece and it is overwhelming in its heft. But I have to say, I would love the involuntary gym program that comes with wearing this watch. This is my style. As outrageous as it looks, it isn't nearly outrageous enough because it looks like it's made of steel. And to the outward world, it could be. This is stealth wealth of the highest degree. People think it's expensive when in fact it's outrageously expensive. And I have to mention it will wear on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference as this is nominally the 42 millimeter offshore and thus compatible with the smaller wrist. Plus you can see on the crown guard side the crown shoulder and the chronograph pushers are in ceramic. 100 meters water resistant, a 60 hour power reserve, 55 to 60 hours to be precise, and you can see through the case back, Audemars Piguet manufacturer caliber 3126, automatic winding, ceramic rotor bearings, the coats of arms of the Audemars and the Piguet family reminding you that AP is the oldest continuously family owned watch brand in Switzerland. And again, the virtues of a bracelet you don't have to worry about taking this thing for a swim. The Platinum is good to go. Even if you sink, it's going to swim. Okay, let's jump into something a bit more discreet. Let's jump into the aquatic watch that flies below the surface and below the radar. This is properly known not as the No Date, but as the Submariner. Dating back to 1953, the Submariner, without a date, is the icon of Rolex. Sorry GMT, sorry Daytona, you're part of the Pantheon and the Canon, but you are not the Emperor of the Realm. This is the one that arguably sits at the core of Rolex's reputation, the heart of its history. Graceful at 40 millimeters, only 12.7 millimeters thick. It's low enough to wear underneath a cuff. And across the wrist, only 51 millimeters lug to lug, caliber 3130 inside, 48 hour power reserve, superlative chronometer guaranteed to run no worse than minus two plus two seconds per day with a clasp that is more than just diving kit. Now the glide lock system, you could see it inside the clasp. It's a little bit difficult to do this backwards, but you could see how there's 20 millimeters of adjustability in two millimeter increments inside this clasp. So you can use it to fine tune the fit, but you can also use it to extend over a dive suit of any kind or simply thick winter coats and sweaters. The sound of the bezel is somewhere between cream and crisp. It's refined, but not over refined. And I'm gonna give you a listen up against the mic. So good and so satisfying. I also have to mention that it is not the only contestant for Rolex icon status. It is the winner of the contest, but there is an icon just behind the Submariner and coming up fast. Born on the racetrack, the Rolex Daytona remains an icon to fans of motorsports, as well as one of the most versatile all-around men's or women's options. Thin enough to be a dress watch at 12.3 and graceful enough with a case that contrasts dramatically against the Submariner. I'm going to show you what a sub super case looks like juxtaposed crystal to crystal against a Daytona case. You can see in profile how the Daytona case is nicely rounded. It has a little bit of a sculpting on its side and a compound curvature that's missing in the sheer Submariner. And when you look at the lugs next to each other, you can see just how thick the lug of the Submariner is compared to the elegant taper of 
of the Daytona. Although both of these watches are slender, the Daytona is just a bit more so. And in terms of grace, there is no comparison. You can see the center links of the Daytona polished for effect. Utilitarian on the Submariner. Center links are satin finished, so this is a graceful watch, this Daytona. And although it is a sports watch and 100 meters water resistant, it looks just at home under a tight dress cuff peeking out from under the dress shirt beneath. Now I should mention, both of these watches with ceramic bezels, the Daytona is an exceptional piece because its bezel is non-rotating, so it looks lower, but it also looks bigger, as the bezel, absent any metal hardware, visually extends the black dial of this 116500LN, creating a larger impression. It's a 40 millimeter watch that nevertheless looks a bit more like a 41 or a 42. The wrist presence is second to none. It is graceful, and in terms of pure fit, it is just a bit more agreeable with my wrist than the Submariner, about a millimeter narrower across the wrist at the end links. Three-day power reserve, by the way, and a vertical clutch column wheel chrono with which to be reckoned. That said, those are watches that need no hype and no introduction. We talk about them all the time. I would even go so far as to say it's hard to avoid them because someone on some watch channel is always hyping one of those watches 24 hours a day. A watch we don't discuss often enough and which has been largely devoid of hype since its 2005 Basel World debut is the Breguet 7027 La Tradition. This is effectively the modern design DNA of Breguet as a wristwatch company. It answered the core question, what is the aesthetic of a post-Abraham Louis Breguet dress watch. He only made pocket watches, so how do you transpose the look of a pocket watch onto a wristwatch? Well, you do it by effectively emulating the layout of his train, the aesthetic of his bridges, the proportions of his cases, but you invert it all so it's on the dial side of the watch. As you can see, the focal point of this dial is the barrel, the mainspring, and then the great wheel the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel, and a balance, which as you can see, appears at first glance to be anachronistic with a frosted finish and Abraham Louis Breguet's blued parachute shock protection system, not Inca block, not Eta shock, not Kif, but then you pull the crown, you hack the balance, and you could see that there is a full recessed bolt, free sprung aerodynamic balance gloriously silvered and borne on a handmade Breguet overcoil, so this watch keeps excellent time in any orientation. You'll also note that where there are engravings on the base plate, which is also frosted, they are freehand engraving. For example, for the power reserve up to 50 hours, there is a hand guilloche, that is true rose lathe, cut on the main dial. The hands are fired steel to blue them, and then the dial is made of solid gold turned on a rose lathe and then silvered to create the aesthetic you see here. You'll also appreciate that there is tremendous depth to this dial, and at horizontal angles you really get the best of that. You'll also appreciate that not only are the half bridges in the fashion of a Breguet pocket watch, but the spoke style of the wheels also in the fashion of a vintage pocket watch or clock. Turn it all over, and you can see the long form power reserve, which includes the actual mechanism that powers the power reserve with a second reserve indicator on the case back. This is caliber 507DR, beaten away at 21.6, and you'll appreciate there, there is freehand engraving on the reverse side of the main plate as well. And while you may have your doubts about the finish because the style is not familiar, do not. As I turn the watch, you can see the mirrored anglage lighting up on the edge of every bridge. The same chamfering that we saw on the Vacheron, and you can really see it under my finger now, is present and correct on the edge of every bridge inside of this Breguet, an immaculate, thematically and artistically successful execution of modern Breguet design language. And at 38.5 millimeters in white gold, it wears a treat. This is an easy watch to wear and an easy one to slip under a cuff. You can see just how flat it is on my wrist. And the timepiece ideal for wrists as small as 13 centimeters circumference, not just beautiful, but beautifully proportioned and dimensioned, both of them at the same time, for wrists of any size, a wonderful unisex option. And I have to say that in terms of value, that's one heck of a pre-owned buy, but it can't hold a candle to this. Now, I love complications, you love complications, and unfortunately, the Perpetual Calendar is rarely one of the more accessible. But thanks to the Mont Blanc Heritage Spirit Perpetual Calendar, 
we have a sub 40 millimeter stainless steel automatic winding perpetual calendar, a timepiece of exceptional quality. And when you rotate it over, you can see it's powered by a rock solid ETA base. The payoff being that anyone can service the base movement and it is tank tough, a watch that anyone can wear on a daily basis. And that's the point. This is the fusion of luxury horology and high horology, bringing that grand complication element, the perpetual calendar to the pre-owned segment at roughly $7,000. So this watch used for seven grand gives you not a complete calendar, not an annual calendar, but a true perpetual calendar in a graceful and versatile case that even a 13 and a half centimeter wrist can wear. And it's wonderfully flat. So if you're gonna wear it as a dress complication, it's compatible with just about any wrist. I truly love the value proposition here as well as the durability for everyday use. That's exceptional and extravagant, but perhaps not bonkers. Bonkers is gonzo. Bonkers is gung-ho. Bonkers pushes the limit. And frankly, the Zenith Defiel Primero 21 is bonkers. 44 millimeters in titanium with the Zenith El Primero chronometer caliber 9004, 53 joules, automatic winding, two escapements, two power reserves, and the exceptional ability to measure one one hundredth of a second. That is a one one hundredth of a second foudroyant hand. You'll also appreciate that there is a second escapement with a second high rate balance. The second high rate balance, and you might be able to see it better through the case back, operates at incredible velocity. So you have 36,000 vibrations per hour, and then you have 360,000 vibrations per hour. Also note that the escape wheel and the escapement for the time, the conventional 10 beat per second El Primero, it is a lovely iridescent purple blue, a full silicon escapement for the conventional El Primero. And let me show you something that no other El Primero can achieve. You pull the crown, you hack the seconds. Hacking seconds on an El Primero was not possible from 1969 until this watch bowed in 2017. An El Primero first. The watch is also titanium and 44 millimeters, so though it's large and 100 meters resistant, it packs a lot of complication, automatic winding, and substantial water resistance into a wearable case. You can see it's nicely constrained at under 50 millimeters lug to lug so that even a small wrist can wear it. And it's a graceful form inspired by the DeFi watches of the 70s. Although it does appear in many respects inspired by Hublot, this case form line for line was in fact inspired by Zenith's own watches of the 1970s era. You'll also appreciate the depth of the dial. As with the Breguet, you can look at this one from a diagonal vantage point and truly appreciate how deep it is. Every layer of dial fixtures, calibrations, bridges, plates, wheels, trains, springs, barrels is visible and that on both sides. This is a timepiece that pushed the limit integrating Tag Heuer technology with Zenith heritage and a little bit of design flair from the Zenith back catalog. And here you can better see that full silicon escapement, both the anchor and the escape wheel operating unlubricated, giving this watch a no sweat five year service interval. What a monster. Oh, and it has a voice that is unique. I'm going to hold it up to the mic. This 1 one hundredth of a second foudroyant is very vocal. I don't lie. And neither does this watch. But then again, that watch can speak for itself. Okay. Foudroyant timepieces are fun, which is why I have three of them on the table today. And this one, truth be told, might be my favorite of the three. Launched in 1999 in 250 pieces to celebrate 70 years of Scuderia Ferrari, the racing team, not the auto constructor, this is the Gerard Perigo Scuderia Rattrapont. Now I'm gonna remove my fingerprints and show you why the yellow gold version of this watch is the most desirable. They were available in other metals, and yes, there is a platinum version, but with the combination of a split second chronograph, and a one eighth of a second foudroyant. This is a compound complication, automatic winding, by the way, that is beautiful both aesthetically and technically. It's an engineering masterclass, and it's a 
case study in understatement as the only Ferrari co-branding that's visible off the wrist is the Scuderia Ferrari initial in red lacquer on the black dial base. Now the di black dial base is black lacquer. You can see that there is a double calibration scale outboard for reading fractions of a second as well as a tachymeter scale for gauging the speed of a Ferrari car. The yellow gold hands are lush leaf style, and then you have sub-registers with a matte finish and concentric snailing that are absolutely explosive against the gloss base with applique yellow gold Arabic numerals. Turn it all over, and you can see the shield of Scuderia Ferrari. Why is Scuderia Ferrari the team older than the automaker, which after all was established in 1947? That is because the racing team, Scuderia Ferrari, was originally the factory Alfa Romeo Equipe, run by Enzo Ferrari. The racing team started with Alfa before, as Enzo later put it, he killed his mother by beating them in Grand Prix competition during the 1950s. And this watch is a tribute to the tradition of racing, which precedes road cars at Scuderia and Ferrari itself throw it on the wrist. Though a 40 millimeter at over 50 millimeters lug to lug, this one has impressive wrist stance. It's really more like a 42 or a 43, and you can see the lugs are broad. The case form is almost exactly that of the WWTC chronograph, so you get a good sense of its size and shape, and it is a watch with a sense of drama about it. A high-grade piece with a movement jointly developed by La Joux Perret, Gerard Perrigo and Graham, would you believe it, back in the 1990s. It's based on a Valjoux 7750, 44 hour automatic winding with the 1 8th of a second foudreau and the split second capability. And I promised you multiple foudreau. Let's see, what is my most dramatic watch on the table? I have, I should be perfectly frank, four foudreau timepieces on the table today, of which three are chronographs. And the one-time winner of the GPHG, Aguido, the FP Journe Santagraph Souverain, 40 millimeters in rose gold. This is the boutique exclusive model with the blackened dial with rose gold paint that actually includes elements of paint and gold in equal measure. So this is true gold paint on a dial that is a lovely matte black with a black polished center bezel. And you could see Foudreau one one hundredth of a second like the Zenith, but also with a 20 second dial and a 10 minute dial. Now the point here is that there is a tachymeter on each one. So you can gauge objects moving as quickly as 36,000 kilometers per hour or as slowly as six kilometers per hour. It truly has the broadest range of any tachymeter chronograph in the world. 40 millimeters in red gold, all of this powered by the extraordinary caliber 1506. Now, as with the Breguet, the barrel is the focal point at the center. One part of the mechanism operates off the arbor or the axle of the barrel. The other portion is driven off the rim of the barrel itself, thus allowing the chronograph to operate without losing any amplitude, a rare refinement that it shares with the Giger Le Coult Duomet. Manual wind, 80 hour power reserve, a free sprung balance beating way at 21,600 vibrations per hour. You'll note the circular Cote de Genève mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge as well as in the jewel and screw countersinks, black polished screw heads, a satin finished crown wheel, and then an engine turned prolage in two sizes, large and small, just below the balance. Throw it on the wrist. An exceptional watch that just under 48 millimeters lug to lug wears more easily on my wrist than the Girard Perigo and considerably flatter at under 10 millimeters thick. This is a graceful watch with a lovely domed bezel and while I love the black label version, I do have to admit that the rose gold black dial rose numeral boutique edition is just a bit warmer, perhaps a bit more charming as well. High-end watchmaking in Geneva did not start with F.P. Journe, however. The oldest continuously operating Genevois watch firm is Vacheron Constantin. Since 1755, continuous operation through many eras, and this is a watch that celebrates too. Released in late 2017, this is the Historique 1942. This is a timepiece dedicated to a Le Coult powered original of the early 1940s that exhibited the best of mid-century modern dress watch design with a corn de vache or cow horn style lug. Some would also describe these as, as 
claw lugs, and you can see why. They frame a triple Gaudron stainless steel 40mm case with a generously domed box section crystal designed to evoke plexiglass. Now, true to history, you have a radial pointer style date indicator, and you have red on silver date discs, as well as a red on silver, well, I should say date circumference with day and month discs. You'll also appreciate that the numerals themselves, featuring lush open threes and open nines, open sixes, and that wonderful serif style too, designed to evoke those earlier watches, which is why some originally cited the style as a little bit plain, but it's true to history, and the charm exudes from the materials. It really endears itself to you over time, and I've come to love this watch, right down to its needle style, baton hands for the hours and the minutes. Now you turn the watch over, and here's where we go modern again. Though the architecture is very traditional, with a center wheel, you can see that this is Geneva Hallmark manufacture of the modern era to the highest standard. Now let's focus on the fact that you have the Ponson de Genève, center wheel architecture, Cote de Genève, mirrored anglage, black polished screws, engine turned base plate, all of it with a manual wind power reserve between 60 and 65 hours. Now when you throw this watch on the wrist, you realize although it is a 40, this stainless steel timepiece, and Vacheron is letting you pay for the watch making, not forcing you to pay a precious metal premium. This is a watch under 48 millimeters lug to lug that wears nicely on the wrist and sits well flush. This is a timepiece that you could wear in any occasion. Yes, it's descended from a dress watch, and true Vacheron is known for its dress watches, but in steel with a minimalism and versatility to it, you really can wear this watch anywhere except in the water. Right up to the water's edge, this is a sports casual timepiece that just happens to draw its cues from the dress watches of Halcyon era Vacheron mid century. Sometimes, however, you need to go your own direction and listen to your own inspiration, march to your own drummer, and that's what Glasuta Original did back in 2008 with the original Pano Inverse, a watch that defines the brand the way the 7027 La Tradition defines Breguet. This is a watch that takes all the pleasure of a display case back on a German-style wristwatch, and it brings it to the fore on the dial side. You'll note that there are jewels set in screw-fixed chiton, three-quarter style bridge for the movement. You have double, not, not single, not a balance cock like you'll find on Langa, but a full balance bridge, both sides freehand engraved with black polished duplex swan's neck indicators. This caliber 66 featuring an extraordinary amount of action on the dial side, right down to the black polished screws and black polished power reserve indicator denoting the 42 hours of reserve. There is a big engine turning on the base plate, and when you turn it all over, by the way, note that this is a loomed dial, you could see that there's, there's a handsome case back, but the watch is designed to be enjoyed from the other side, which is wonderful because although it is tempting to take the watch off and hand to your friends at dinner to try to convert them to the faith, as I like to say, oftentimes that is exactly when a watch gets dropped. So to be able to display the best of mechanical watchmaking and the romance of the hobby without removing it from your wrist is the best of both worlds and offers additional security against an unintentional trip back to Glasuta. Throwing it on the wrist, the 42 millimeter case wears fairly easily. As you can see, about 42 millimeters flat and saucer-like with tightly downturned sub 50 millimeter lug to lug dimension, this is a watch that you can wear on a smaller wrist right down to 14 centimeters. Is it a dress watch? Is it a sports watch? I'd call it an all-arounder. Like the Vacheron 1942, it certainly isn't a classical sports watch, but it has a sports casual versatility to it, and with the addition of loom on the dial side, it's just that much more of an all-arounder. All of which said, Parmigiani Fleurier offers a different take on a true dress watch, the Tonda Automatic with champagne dial. They make the dial, the hands, the case, the movement, even the small parts like hairspring balance and escapement. This is 39 millimeters in white gold, and you can see the Tonda with those teardrop lugs emblematic of Michel Parmigiani's designs. Easy to wear on a small wrist as it spans under 47 millimeters lug to lug and wears easily. Automatic winding with a 50 hour power reserve, this white gold champagne dial watch has immense individuality to it and superb ergonomics. Turn it over and you can see that the movement is visually related to the twin barrel 55 hour automatic used in the base 
caliber of the Richard Mille RM11, but only on the RM11, it's a customer caliber. Here, it is made in-house. An impressive effort from Vauche Manufacture, the movement arm of Parmigiani, and you can see the lush Hermes strap, as Hermes is both a stakeholder in Parmigiani and the exclusive supplier of straps for Parmigiani Fleurier. What a dial, almost like ripples across a pond. Jumping into the realm of dress watches, we should mention that a dress chronograph provides a stark contrast with the sporting Daytona, and even the Santograph that we saw earlier. This is a true dress chronograph from Alango und Zona. This is the 1815 Flyback Chronograph Boutique Edition. Launched in 2015, this one reverts to much of the dial graphics of the original 2004 to 2008 1815 chronograph, marking the return of blueprint and the much-loved outboard scale. Here it's a pulsation scale that is used to gauge the speed of a pulse. So the return of the pulsation scale really makes this watch. Now, if you want to know the difference between this one and the original, you can always tell at a glance the original had blued hands at center, whereas these are black polished alpha style. 39.5 millimeters, you turn it all over and you have caliber 9515. Manual wind, 60 hour power reserve. It is a flyback chronograph architecture, so you have the ability to reset and restart instantaneously. It is a lateral clutch column wheel chrono, so you could see that column wheel in action with its levers and horns. You could see the lateral clutch, which is fully jeweled, jumping into and out of contact, and then you could see the recentering hammers falling on the heart cam when you recenter everything. As with the Glasuta, we see German watch standards here, but unlike the Glasuta, true German silver bridges in nickel copper zinc with a lovely and lush golden hue, blued screws, blackened screws, black polished swan neck, satin finished steel levers, and of course that freehand engraved balance cock with black polished swan's neck. You can see how many black polished components there are in this movement because they all turn black as I tilt the movement towards the camera. And just as we discussed the dial depth of the Zenith and the Breguet, we have incredible depth about the movement structure of this caliber L9515 on the 1815 chronograph. I'm going to throw it on the wrist. This is a watch in white gold that has a good deal of substance to it. Heft. You know you're wearing something special. Not quite as special as that Platinum AP, but this is just as engaging and arguably far more versatile. This might, given its paucity of extraneous details and slender profile, be a more appealing watch than the 2012 to present Datagraph up-down Generation 2 Dato. I like this better. Okay, speaking of Audemars Piguet, I should allow them a repost after claiming that the offshore was impressive but inelegant. How about a jumbo? How about the original 15202? You can see there is a silver contrasting date disc and the logo is at 12. That's how you know you're looking at a 15202. Plus the numerals themselves are outboard of rather cropped lozenge style indices. Now what really sets the early 15202 apart from the post 2012 is the grace of the winding rotor. You can see that gold mass freehand skeletonized and finished with the Audemars Piguet logo. They don't do it like that anymore in Le Brasseau, and that is a shame. The new rotor is very industrial, even as the caliber 2120, based on the JLC 920 Bausch, retains most of its charm and fine finish on the current generation of the watch. It always seems that the past was just a bit more romantic, and while that's often just wistful nostalgia, here there's some objective truth to it done the right way. And the blue dial, the one that's the boutique and premier retailer exclusive. Oh, le okay, let's dive deep. How deep? How about 120 meters with the 2018 Moser Pioneer Fume Green? 42.8 millimeters in stainless steel. This is a watch you can pick up for about $10,500 and it gives you true swimmability. Pick this up, not a 120 meter Nautilus, a loomed dial with applique diamond polished faceted indices. You can see that the loom cleverly is placed out board of the dial itself so as not to clutter it. You can see it's actually on a dished flange or rehot outboard. Lovely leaf style hands and a paucity of printing. This fume metallic dial, which is lighter at its center and darker at its edges, is a signature of Moser. And while they make a blue version of this watch, the green is the one to own. Not just because I'm a partisan of green, because it is objectively more striking. It catches the eye from farther away. In Moser fashion, we have evacuated lugs here with a lovely gradient striation. And then turn it all over, you have the HMC 200 movement. In 
entirely in-house, automatic winding with a three-day power reserve. It features stop seconds and it beats way at 21.6. You'll also note Moser's distinctive double-crested Cote de Genève. It's not a single sweeping arc. It has a double crest and the double crest is distinctive of this brand, giving it a little bit of a visual kinship with Grunefeld. These are great watches by a company that makes everything right down to its hair springs and its balances through its subsidiary Precision Engineering, the other sports watch brand out of Schaffhausen. And you do need to consider Moser a sports watch brand through and through these days. Finally, where can we finish? We need a big and rousing conclusion. I've got two in rapid succession that are exactly that. The Chapter 3 from Mike Le Duton. We featured the Piece Unique by... Andre Martinez with the micro-painted dial, but that one lost the calendar, and it featured a more subdued aesthetic, so the calibrations were harder to read. Here you see the watch, 42 millimeters in rose gold, with the movement by Andreas Streller and Kari Voudelainen, and you can see the signature barrel system. The barrels will jump side to side, and they represent the second time zone of the watch. So you have a second time zone with two 12-hour barrels, and then you have your primary time zone at center. You have a day-night indicator for that second time zone, and it will jump automatically. You can watch as we transition to the sunny, hand-painted barrel that is the AM-PM indicator, and you can see on the reverse side the moon, which is also hand-painted. This is the SCH-03 movement, and it's finished to a standard that would win Kerry Voudelainen's approval because he set the finishing standard for this movement. Michael Dutomp combining rock star watchmakers for their Chapter 1, Chapter 2, and Chapter 3 watches, achieving an incredible alchemy with this watch. Their first watch, unlike the absolute Brobdenagian chapters 1 and 2, a wearable 42 millimeters here and under 50 millimeters lug to lug, a powerful combination of a black dial and a rose gold case. Where do we finish? We finish with, well, we finish where I started, Jeger Le Coult, my original love. The Duomet Cantiem Lunaire, two power reserves, a calendar, a moon phase indicator, and the most remarkable zero reset second system you will ever see. Zero resetting the foudron as well as the time. Double reset, allowing you to set this watch precisely. There's a power reserve scale for both the Cantiam Lunaire and the balance itself. So you have everything, including the display, and then you have a separate power reserve with two mainspring barrels, not one, two mainspring barrels driving two separate drivetrains, and they cross at a single balance and a single regulator with the anchor the escapement acting as a traffic cop, switching one on, one off, on off, on off, splitting the power at the balance to the two separate purposes such that you can run the time and the complications without any loss whatsoever of chronometric precision. And that's the miracle of the Duomet, which likewise features incredible movement depth, also German silver bridges. And since we're in the Valley de Joux, we shall call it by its francophone name, Major, blued screws. You'll note that there is a lovely engine turned perlage on the base plate, as well as through the channel above the bridges, and the Cote de Soleil radiating out from the free sprung balance. Throw it on the wrist, 42 millimeters. This is a big and impressive dress complication. It's one of the few dress watches that can truly go head to head with the biggest and the boldest of sports watches, proving you don't need a sports watch to have all the fun. I hope your Sunday night is awesome. If you're riding on the roads with me, stay safe. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out, thanks for logging on.